Good evening, it's March 24. I'm Arnon Grünberg. We are in the Bali in Amsterdam and I extend also a warm welcome to the people who are watching this conversation with Adian Adania Shibli. Adania, yes? Adania Shibli at home from their offices, their kitchens, their bathrooms or bedrooms. Before I'm going to introduce uh, Adania Shibli to you, uh, I will tell you a bit about what you can expect tonight and the people who have been here before might know what they can expect. I will talk for about 60, 70, 80 minutes with Adania, depending on your mood, depending on the mood of the people in the audience. And then uh, you can ask questions. Uh, Jante will walk around with a mic. And as you might know, I'm quite strict with what a question is. It consists of, uh, let's say, four sentences, max, and then a question, question mark. So uh, no opinions, no personal anecdotes, please. All this. Uh, you can relieve yourself from it afterwards in the bar, but uh, not during the conversation. Of course, there's free speech, but for the time of the Q&A, it's a bit less than you're um, used to. Uh, and also, you, you're going, okay, goodbye. Thank you, this, oh, this is good, okay. Yeah, good. If, if more people feel like leaving, this is the time. Um, <laughs> Also, to let you know, and then maybe some more people will go, um, Adania asked me to really focus on her books. And, oh, no. Yeah, come in. Somebody left. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Take a seat. Um, Adania asked me to uh, focus on her books and uh, to not have a so-called political discussion about the situation. So if you are here for a political discussion, and of course, literature is not outside the world of politics, but still, I think most people do know what I mean. Uh, you will be disappointed. And you can leave, but please now and not later. Okay. Adania Shibli, and correct me if I make mistakes. I was born in Palestine in 1974. She's a writer of novels, short stories, plays, and essays. In 2002, her first novel, Massas, was published. In 2010, translated into English as Touch. And it, uh, this novel received the Young Writers Award Palestine. Her novels deal with themes such as love and family, but are always set against the violent background of the conflict. And I know, and you share this with many authors, you don't like to talk about the novel, what's about, but I have the feeling that I have to be a bit polite for the people who have not read your novel, uh, Un Klein Detail, minor detail. So how many people of you in the audience have read in what language ever? Oh, quite a few. Yeah, that's, that's not too bad. I'm proud of you. Um, <laughs> but, but for those of you who haven't read the, the novel, I will say a bit what's about. Uh, we follow a young woman who becomes obsessed with the brutal, brutal rape and murder of a Palestinian girl by a group of Israeli soldiers in 1949, one year after 48, the Nakba, or the existence, the beginning of the existence of Israel. Minor Detail was long-listed for the International Booker Prize and short-listed for the National Book Awards for translated literature. And last month, the Dutch, the Dutch translation came out. Alongside her writing, Shibli is also engaged in academic research. She holds a PhD from the University of East London in Media and Cultural Studies, studies and she completed a postdoctoral fellowship in Berlin. Since 2013, she has been teaching part-time at the Department of Philosophy and Cultural St Studies at Birzeit University. Are you still doing this? Because uh, no. No. And you split your time between Berlin and Palestine? Now less. Now less. <laughs> so you're now more in, in Berlin or more in...? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, I, I, sometimes I think I'm still engaged, not I think, but I'm actually engaged in, in what's happening in Palestine in terms of cultural work. Uh, so I still work there, but I'm not always present uh, f after the uh, pandemic. It was hard to go yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so it's actually, it's a rupture. It's created somehow a rupture. I know we're back to life, but there are for many people, actually, it also created a new reality. Uh, and I think in that sense, um, it was too hard to be absent. That's actually the first time I also was so long uh, far away from Palestine for two years. Uh, I tried to go back, but each time the flight was cancelled. I keep buying and keep cancelling, you know. Yeah. 
So that was also for two years you couldn't see your parents, your son couldn't see his grandparents. You were stuck in Berlin, basically. Yeah, and actually, it's not only the family, it's also the landscape sometimes. You feel this is a landscape that I, I dearly miss. I actually, somehow, also nostalgic, I went to uh, the sea today, uh, imagining this is the Mediterranean, pretending this is the Mediterranean. You went here in the Netherlands to, to Zandvoort, maybe, to yeah. Zandvoort. Yeah. Imagining that it's like... A Mediterranean, you know, you have the pine trees and you think, ah, oh, this is a Mediterranean pine. So we always are good in um, making these... Uh, Illusions for ourselves, I think, as writers, no? We, as right, yes. And as yeah. people. As people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to think about it, if, if this is true for all of us. Yeah. I have the feeling it's more so for you than for many others. Yeah. I'd like to start with a question about your name, yeah. if that's okay. Because in 2021, you said something to David Nyman in a very interesting interview between the covers. You told him that you were forced by the Israeli government to change your name. I will quote the, from the interview if that's okay. Um, first, you said it's fascinating that you don't under, understand how it's being reduced, being belittled and being hated so immensely. And then you say that you were by the authorities in Israel forced to change your name. We were called Spare. I remember that we didn't stop at that, but I didn't understand what, what was the big deal as a kid for me because I related to my name, Adania. It already was strange enough that it was a big burden. It's not a common name in Arabic. But I remember there was this unease. You felt it with your parents. They didn't tell us anything. Our parents always tried to exclude us from any serious conversations, basically. There was this moment in your name that suddenly in the 80s changed. In fact, I have it now. The only document carrying this old name is my driving license that's issued by the Israeli driving department or traffic department. Yeah, how did you dig that? <laughs> okay. So tell yes. me first. Yeah. yeah. Before it's the surname. It's not the first name. Okay. So yeah, it's... Uh, and this, actually, the change of, of name is not only... Uh, you have the change... And this is, I think, the power of, of language or the moment you discover what is language for you as a Palestinian. Even the word Palestine in this context is not mentioned. Uh, so language is very strong. You realize the names of the places are not the names that they were there. I, you know, we had these uh, villages that were destroyed in 1948, but we knew their names somehow. These names, they were never on the road signs. So it's, it's almost like the landscape opens up to a different linguistic uh, uh, reality. And behind every name you think, or every word, you think there is a shadow of another word that is not accepted, that has been deleted, that has a, has a, a change. And then also it came to our surname, uh, my family name, which used to be Sbeh, uh, but after the war it was changed to Shibli. Uh, and after 48? After 48, yeah. And this is uh, the last documents. Uh, as if the condition for us to be in Palestine to remain where we are is by changing our name. And it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I never understood that why, but apparently I learned when I was in my 20s, there is uh, uh, lands that are registered on the name of our family as a collective. And with the shift of the name, you also lose the access to the land. And it's also the, the change of names of villages. Uh, and uh, what is being recognized, it's almost a new start. You start as Shibli, you're going to be Shibli. I like Shibli. The problem, I like it more than Spey. Uh, and then... You Why see, is that? Why do you like Shibli? Because you're more used to it? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I... You know, if we're going to language, it's, uh, the music is... is uh, M more interesting in the name Shibli than Speer. Though the, the name Speer, it also relates to uh, our family and its, uh, uh, how do you say, the, uh, the, uh, the power of the women because it is those men who were brothers of Sabha, so they are Speer. And all the name comes in relation to the sister. Uh, that uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, she was strong and, uh, and dominant, and she created the family. And so 
all these kids belong to her, all the brothers belong to her. And so our family was known to have strong women. Not me, I'm like, you know, <laughs> but they are. Uh, so, uh, and they were known to, with this association of the name. So it's also, there's a shift of relations of men and women. Right. I mean, women are still strong there, and uh, this is, I think, in the, in, uh, in Palestine, Israel, the, often the attack is on the male, and it's easier. Uh, the occupation, the, the military acts, the, the arrests are, dominantly are uh, directed to the male. And uh, the male is the one who is humiliated. So within this, the, the woman or the female, she rises to, uh, to hold the family, to defend even, to, to face the soldiers when they take the son. So you always have this image, like uh, the woman is there ahead. And, uh, so you mean this makes the women more powerful? Yes. yes. It ha it, They're forced it to be more powerful. Yeah. Uh, and, and especially because also I think with, you know, military is normally a very uh, patriarchal structure that even wouldn't care about the behavior of a woman because a woman considered like, yeah, hysterical, she shouts, we don't take a woman talk seriously. And this is very interesting how it leaves a space for actually the woman to fight when a man cannot because a man would be shot. But a woman... It's just a woman, you know, how the military consider her, and they would not shoot her. So we, she would have more power, more ability to, to confront soldiers at this moment. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I miss this element of the, the sister uh, and, the, and the name, but I like uh, Shibli. How come that, that the name Shibli was chosen? Was it? Uh, that's a mystery. I try to understand. I really don't understand if it was an invention, if it was a creation. I try to investigate my parents. And, you know, they are uh, the most, uh, how do you say, uh, experts in evading an investigation. So you ask them and they say, yeah, well, and then, yeah, can you answer where does, is it our family? Well, there was a cousin and then, oh, can you get that hot water there? Like, no, we're talking about the name. And it's like, ah, yeah. So it, 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 they can drag you for 10 years, exhaust you with not finding, uh, and then you give up. <laughs> so your parents are specialists also in, in silence in a way. Yeah, yeah. Both mother and father. Uh, I would say my father specifically, and uh, it was. I remember these moments, and I think these are the moments also when when I learned reflection because we would sit together like for hours, not saying any word, just dreaming. I I was addicted to this idea. There is a. a, a a term in Arabic called staring into emptiness, which is addictive. So you just sit and stare into emptiness, nothing. And this is a practice also of, of uh, imagination, the start of imagination, daydreaming, that is accepted as a practice. With my mother, yeah, she was silent with us, but not with her friends. And that's why also as a kid, I was so much fascinated by this shift from her silence into this conversation. So I always wanted to witness how this moment that she stops to be silent from, and all the stories that happens between her and her friends, they would come and, uh, you know, from a hello, then there's something develops somewhere and goes in all directions. And I think this is the art of, of uh, how something suddenly language or stories come out from nothing. And I was really fascinated. I always tried to, to listen to them, but they always discovered me. I tried to hide because I, w I was curious what they were saying. But for her, it was her time with her friends. She didn't want me there. So, yeah. But also maybe this longing for stories came out of the fact because your parents obviously had so many secrets for you. There were so many things that could not be discussed. Yeah, and 
I mean, I'm also attracted to silence because it also gives you the many possibilities of not holding something. It's, it's things are not pinned. Not that language can, is imprisoning, but it stops a possibility. Because, I mean... It, what do you mean by that? You... So when there is silence, you can put on it as many possibilities as possible. Uh, and it's interesting because sometimes we think about silence mainly in terms of silencing, that somebody is silenced and then we need to break the silence. I mean, it's very interesting about the idea of breaking silence, but what if we don't break it? What, what if we take silence as, as almost a possibility of, of being, of, uh, uh, of existing? Why do we need to articulate the whole time? And I think for me, this dilemma was solved by writing, because writing actually takes place in silence. You don't have to speak. Yes. You write silently. And also you said in one of your interviews that you try to, to put a silence into your words, into your novel. But before we... we, we I, I'd like to explore silence maybe later, but I'd like to go back for a second to your 2010 novel, Touch, translated by Paula Haidar. The main character is a young girl, and um, you write something about her that, that you th spoke about your parents and about avoiding certain subjects. There was a sentence that I wrote down that, that reminded me of what you just said. I'd like to read it to you. Um, you wrote, the girl tried to understand the meaning of the words Sabra and Shatila. Maybe there were one word. The word Palestine was unclear, except that its use was forbidden. So uh, what we see here, what we see in this novel is that, that the main character tries to find out. She's not, she, what's happening? What's the meaning of the words? She's not content. She's not satisfied with the silence as you are now. It's not that she's not content. She's asking why. She's not judging this is wrong and I need to break, but she's, and I think this is something different. You know, I'm not saying we should be silent, but I'm thinking what brings us to the silence. I'm, I'm interested really on the way to the silence. On the way? On, on how we reach from the silence. From making noise, from talking? To that, what brings us to this moment of silence? What are the conditions that bring us to silence? And, uh, I mean, sometimes language is, is not ready, and spe especially when we're speaking. I think speaking uh, uh, constantly demands that language is there, present for us, and we are capable to articulate. And there are often the, the possibility of not articulating and what it carries, the fact that you cannot articulate or you don't want to articulate, is, is not accepted. And, and why we cannot articulate. I think instead of asking what we are not articulating, I think it's also important to, to ask why we are not articulating. Uh, I know my parents didn't uh, maybe tell us things that they did not want also to tell themselves. Mm -hmm. And by telling themselves again that, almost bringing something uh, in a diff different form uh, in language, and they didn't want that. But I give you, for instance, an example, and which I mentioned somewhere else. Like when we were kids, we were going to, to do these picnics. These picnics are not the bourgeois picnics, but we uh, we go to pick up uh, the plants and the fruits uh, that remained in destroyed villages. We don't know this history. Now I know it. Now I can reconstruct that. But as kids, we, we say we're going to Shajara, Lubia, and Serene. Uh, there's no sign on the... This also in your book, no? Lubia. No, this is because it's a different region. Is it? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we go in the car, and we, I, as a kid, you read the signs, but there's no mention of these uh, uh, words of these locations we're going to. So it's already, you're, you're one step somewhere away from what reality is saying is real. 
So you can look at it as silencing of certain names. But we go there. And these villages are empty. Yeah, they're destroyed. So what happens? So they, are, they are. This is what. So you arrive at these uh, villages. They are not. There's. They are not villages. They. We know they are destroyed villages. They have been destroyed villages. 1948. But you arrive there. There is a landscape. So sometimes you see some stones, and you see the grapes, the olives, uh, cactus, and we collect. It's almost you're taking care of the plants that are remaining there for those people who were expelled or forced to flee. And these... On their behalf. On their behalf, yeah. And, and you don't know that, but as if your body is embodying the story, you are not told that. But so what is, where's language here? It's something that has no... Uh, I think if our parents told us this, our body would not have this sense of freedom. It will be a complete different enactment for us. We go to pick up the, the fruit. Uh, we sort of take care of, because if you leave the fruits on the plants, on the trees, on the vines, uh, this, is, this will destroy the, the, the trees because, you know, flies comes and then it becomes ill and so on. It's a way of taking care of the plants to continue. And after we do this, because it also was boring for us as kids to have to do that, so we leave like so how gradually. Often, how often did you do this? We have to do it yearly. Yearly. In the seasons, yeah. you know, we, from the spring, the summer and so on. And uh, You went with your whole family. Let, uh, yeah. Picture well, yeah, like the four, we were the four kind of <laughs> nights. <laughs> yeah. We were four girls and my parents. And, uh, and then, so they would be working harder and we'd kind of, you know, our kids gradually, we run away from the task and we start playing. So vaguely, we know there's a village, but the people are not there. So it's, everything is almost like, um, you know, little pieces of things that you fill everything in your imagination. So we play the people. We decide, okay, this is... You play the people who live there. Yeah. So this is our... How country. old were you when you did this the first we time? We were like... I, I think my sisters were better in playing it. They were 10, I was 6, so we played. This is our living room, and this is our uh, garden, and we, you know, the whole husband and wife and kids and everything. And it, for me... It was suddenly a whole world, and this is the world of imagination. So I think, you know, it's not about, and maybe this is where dif differentiate between history, when you don't have access to history, and where fiction starts. But fiction becomes something not as, a, as a, an extra activity when you are bored, but it is a question of life. This is, your life becomes fiction. You're enacting something in your own way, not by a histor historical manual. And I think, you know, we know how we learn history at school. Like, you know, history is the most boring class. I mean... You hated school anyhow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, but this allows you a different entry into something that is, you know, of course, these, the history of these villages are not mentioned in the history books. And they will not be mentioned, and so they're eliminated from that. But you come and you bring them life through imagination, and probably this is also the first game with imagination, maybe fiction, and maybe language that becomes so essential for you mm -hmm. as, as a kid. And uh, we, we love that. It's, it's almost theater, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But somebody also could say that that's an. That by doing this, I mean, you were born in, in, in the 70s, so you went, as a, when you were eight, six, maybe 30 years, 35 years after the destruction of the villages, you went back there to keep them alive in a way. Somebody could say this is also, you became a prisoner of the past. Or is this a too negative? It's not what I would say. Yeah. It's not my... I wonder if you... I, I, yeah. Maybe in a follow-up question, could you yeah. imagine that your son would go there also, that the tradition keeps on going? I don't want to relate to it as a tradition. I would relate to it as, as intimacy, you know, within a family. Because, you know, with my family, we, we don't spend the time hanging around together. We always, you know, have to work. So it was a form of working, but not working. There is this work, the joy of the imagination. 
And that's why I think it's not about being imprisoned in the past, but actually turning, you leave the past and the present all together and you shift it into something completely New. different. You know? And this is, this is really, I think, already at a young age, you discover the importance of imagination for you as a condition for continuation. And would you say that this transformation, because you're talking what, what, what you just explained is a kind of transformation by making something new out of it, out of the situation, that, that this also could be labeled uh, resistance or not? I think when you label it, I mean, maybe if you watch it from the outside, you perhaps can perceive it so. But it is not about uh, an ideological push that moves you. And I think it's very important to see resistance as, as, a, as a something that embodied in our daily life. Uh, what we do as, uh, as something that is almost naturally there to oppose power, to oppose uh, um, your, uh, your uh, marginalization, or actually turning the margin into something so important for you, for your existence, that you almost only can exist within the margin. Is this what's happening to the woman in the second part of your book? I don't know. <laughs> Before we go to the book, um, you said something about silence again in this interview with Neyman, Neyman um, and you described that, that, that the silence, you said that I'm interested in silence, what you just said also, and that inside the silence there's a lot of deletion, there's a lot of negation. Um, and you, in this interview, you relate the silence very much to um, living in Palestine and the Palestinian condition. Yeah. Or is the yeah? How, what's how how much of this interest in silence is, if you can separate it, if you can make the separation, how much of it is is just your interest? Is 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 can you separate it? Let me phrase it this way: Can you separate it from the fact that you are Palestinian? Or yeah, I mean, you see, for me, I I I am being subject subjected to certain conditions and for to how to think that what kind of literature and possibilities can bring uh, so it is an experience i i think being palestinian being uh, uh, growing up in this re specific relation to language and i you know, also, I, I, like one of my oldest memories in relation to language is, um, you know, when I went to school and uh, we needed to prepare our books for school. And uh, uh, for the school, we bought an atlas. And, you know, to open the atlas and to look and to see... Uh, so you knew there's Palestine, but you didn't know Palestine, Israel, is, everything is kind of confused, a bit hazy because of this inability. I mean, the word, if you say the word Palestine, you would be imprisoned, you would be punished for that. The, the use of the word became only possible in the 90s. And, uh, but you knew somehow, and then you always kind of open the atlas. This is the first thing, you open the page, almost it's, it's a... It's a it's a kind of a, uh, a masochistic act to masochistic. see. Masochistic. Masochistic, because you know it's, you will not be there. But you always hope the possibility that maybe one, one atlas will include it. You include the word Palestine in the atlas. So you constantly watch your deletion, and then you relate to language. How can you come to trust or to love language that you feel, uh, I mean, I, I re real. I realize quite early that I'm in love with language, but I see also language, it has a deletion of something. So there's this tension. So how you turn that I, I, uh, into, as you say, transforming, transforming conditions that eliminate into something else. Because if you agree this is an elimination, you're giving in to the fact this is 
an elimination, but shifting it, I think it's very important. You take it somewhere else. And uh, I was always thinking, what is left when everything is taken? What can you uh, create from that? Even in literature, for me, if you cannot uh, uh, create a, a, a classical narrative structure in the context of Palestine, there's a clear beginning, a clear middle, a clear end. When you grow up without this clarity, what type of literature can you create? What type of novel? What do you do with all these holes, with all these missing words? What kind of literature or, or uh, literary text they can create? And it is a haunting question, and it, it is behind every book, actually. Behind every of your books? Yeah. You are in love with language, you said. Yeah. But you also said tonight, and, and in quite a few of the interviews I read with you, that you are so much interested in silence. So in a way, now I have the feeling that you are in love with language because it enables you to enjoy the silence. Yeah, I mean, writing and, and reading, the, uh, and also the meeting of that, you know, uh, how we, you write in silence, you read in silence, or often. Uh, it's, it's, we're coming to, to the text from two different interests, and this meeting point is, is very intimate. There is a lot of intimacy, and uh, it's fascinating. As a kid, also reading, uh, uh, translated literature into Arabic, it opened Arabic language to so many different possibilities. It's no longer the language that you're only familiar with or the absences, but there's something else that happens. Uh, so uh, language and silence was giving other possibilities if language in, in speaking was not giving these possibilities. Nice. So silence as if allowed language to exist freely more than speaking. Yeah. Yeah, and also that's that's clear. Because not only the the, the the certain words were forbidden, certain events could not be talked about. But basically, you said also somewhere um, that even now, racism in Palestine is not so much based on on the way you look, because yeah. more or less even you said even the European Jews look like. Yeah, no. Become, they became uh, Middle Eastern. Yeah, it's, it's too much hot. The they're too yeah. much sun. <laughs> yeah, it's too much sun. You okay. <laughs> <laughs> cannot distinguish them anymore. So, but the, it's based on language. You betray yourself yeah. by language. Yeah. And this is, this is also a very harsh moment. And it's a moment also of betrayal, your own betrayal. When you, you love the language, you love Arabic language, and suddenly, like, if you speak it, you will be treated, you will be discriminated against, you will be humiliated. If you are a guy, sometimes there are events when you are lynched. With, it's, so, the, so your relation with the language becomes very problematic. How, what can you do? Can you speak it? Or, and what, how language will relate to you? You who betrayed me by being silent. Uh, and and it's, it's a very, very harsh moment that when you start, the moment that you realize you will not speak Arabic, the language that you love most, the language also that you uh, uh, kind of uh, find the joy in. And this is the moment you say, if I speak you this language that I am so much in love with you, I will be punished. But if I don't speak you, I'm punishing you. So it's it's very harsh moment. So language almost became a character to you. This uh, yeah. Arabic language. Yeah. You, you speak Hebrew because you also speak you speak six languages. I, I think. Yeah. It, not all of them good. I mean, not I don't speak anything good. <laughs> you know? But you speak Hebrew in order to to adapt, in order to to make life, if you are there in Palestine, make life less miserable for you? Uh, you are taught also, uh, you know, we're taught from a young age and, uh, and there is a lot of similarities between and, and Arabic and Hebrew. I mean, it's also language, language in itself, it is not a perpetrator. It is a being. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you... All languages or just you a mother tongue? 
I would say I was lucky to be born in Arabic language because I love this language. I don't know what I would feel if I was born in English or, or German. Or, or, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> love yes. It, yeah. Yes. Uh, I'd say in Arabic language, what's specific about it, that it's so much, there's so much uh, 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 appreciation of the language. When we were kids, I remember this in the, the uh, we had a religion class and we asked, uh, there was this open discussion with a teacher and we told him, you know, teacher, actually, you know, there's nothing happened interesting in Islam. Look, you know, like in Judaism, Moses goes and he opens the sea with, with a stick and, uh, you know, all this kind of miracles. And Jesus, he goes and um, you know, make the, the dead alive again. Yeah. But nothing in Islam. Muhammad doesn't do anything. <laughs> and uh, the teacher says us, kids, of course there's a miracle the miracle of the book, and it's in Arabic, like, oh, teacher. But then you understand the appreciation, and actually, the miracle of the language. So this teacher is, is, uh, is not like really, maybe he was in love with the language, but then you understand language is a miracle. I mean, the fact that not only Arabic language, but any language, the fact that we can you know, speak, we can write, we can uh, read, it, it's a fascinating miracle. And then you say, actually, yes, it is a miracle, but it takes you a long time. And with the Arabic language, with the, with the whole tradition of poetry from the fifth century, and, and we learn this at school, and you feel like you and somebody who lived 1,500 years ago, you're touching the same words. You know, you're reading what they wrote, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. You've been using the word love a lot for language. Um, in your second novel, we are, equally, we are all equally far from love from 2012, which is one of the strangest love stories I've ever read in my life. And Sorry. Richard, well, no, that's, that's, I, I wasn't paying you a compliment, but um, <laughs> you can take it uh, in any way. Um, it's quite funny, but it ends... Um, dark and in a way the ending reminded me uh, of uh, some books by an author we both admire uh, could see John could see um, but I'd like to read you from the part from the end of your own novel translated by Paul Starkey there you wrote and ever since a died I have concluded that I will never change I'm not going to become a better person I lack the love to become a better person I lack love I lack love terribly, or perhaps I lack the strength to pretend to love, to do that well. And my last chance was A. A. I forgot that I wrote that. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, maybe <laughs> yeah, I'm that's, to, that's maybe, good maybe about I'm, writing. You don't remember what you wrote. <laughs> I'm here to remind you of the past. That's one of my, uh, my tasks tonight. <laughs> So, um, by saying that you forgot that you wrote this, is, you mean you feel far away from this, this sentence, from this book, maybe? Or maybe now I think of love also differently because, I, uh, you know, where's the, the politics of love or also the presence of love in politics? I, I think somehow we shrank love into the private domain uh, as a, you know, between people, sometimes between non-humans, but it's not present as a concept. Yeah, of course, religions take on the concept of love, and, uh, uh, but how it is, uh, it's, it's very interesting how, if I'm thinking about it now, how it can be in the center of politics, if we're talking about politics. It's constantly politics is being removed as if the combination of love uh, or bringing love within politics and the conversations in politics is completely uh, uh, impossible, or that we love politics and politics in, in, the, in the idea of thinking and caring within politics. Uh, when I was coming here on the way, it's, uh, I was reading Abby Warburg, some of the stuff that he wrote, and he was uh, describing practices by the First Nations uh, and uh, that involves a snake, snakes to, uh, to recall rain. And he mentions one part which is really stuck with me of uh, how snakes uh, in the uh, mythology of the First Nations, of some of the, the First Nations, 
that it, it, it's instigated migration. It's an act to instigate migration. And now we think, because you mentioned earlier also uh, that part of your discussions w were on migration. And, and when we think about the discussion about migration, it so much lacks love as, as, a, as a relation uh, to uh, others. Forgive me for interrupting yeah. you, but isn't there a difference between um, the love you describe here in, in this novel for a person, A, you know, and, and the love, you, the, the, the empathy, the solidarity you can feel with, with people. Is actually, it, um, yeah, there is, I, I, this book was written in 2003 and four. That was a very difficult period in Palestine. And I think why I go back to that bringing love in politics, because at yeah. that time, you realize your inability to love. It was very cruel. And also, it's a time where you think how you can save yourself. It's, it's a, also a very hard moment to think of uh, that brings you to smaller scales. And, uh, and I think some occupation, colonization, destroys your humanity in a way that you, f you are unable to love. You're unable to trust to be uh, falling in love, to commit to the act of love. Not that Palestinians don't love, but it is almost you feel your heart has been so much crushed if we talk about this in a sense of a metaphor or uh, that y you don't have the trust in the world to love. And so that's why I think the lack of love, it is a political, uh, it is an outcome, this failure of, of uh, being in love, being vulnerable, allowing you to feel something. Because if you're gonna feel something, you're also gonna feel so many other things. It's not that you, I'm gonna feel love and I'm gonna not feel what is happening to me there. So you become cold, cold and you're gonna face everything. And this failure to love, it is a political failure. And, and this time writing it, I mean, I was writing, I was not conscious about that. And then I have a few friends that uh, they read. Sometimes they help me to, <laughs> to, uh, to delete the bad things. And one of them actually... They help you to delete the bad... The, the yeah, I mean, they're my readers. They, yes. they give me so their feedback. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, no, this doesn't work. This yeah. doesn't. And uh, one of them, he noted, he said, wow, you wrote this about love in a time that the discussion was only about politics. This is from... Uh, the, I started writing 2000, finished 2003. So this is the... Starting uh, the second intifada. Intifada, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and this... Uh, for me, there was no distinction between the two. It is, this is politics. But politics not in the way that we are reducing politics. It is the politics that is shaping our uh, feelings, our humanity, our despair, our lack of hope as well. And uh, so when you read it now, I, I somehow maybe moved to, to think that love should be at the center of, of politics. It should, it should move. To the center, yeah. In, in a, because, you know, it's quite it, idealistic. Yeah, we can be. <laughs> we can be, yeah. yeah. It's not. It's, do you, it's, do you still, it's, this, this person, in, in, in we are all equally far from love, she claims that you need love to become a better person. Yeah, and I think this is what I, I, uh, I'm trying to, to remember from this period, that the inability to love also destroys, destroys your humanity. I mean, we cannot come and demand people to love when they are being stripped of their humanity, but it's how, how uh, this is also a moment of resistance, how you, you don't become the person that you are being pushed to be, lacking your humanity. And it's... a. Uh, and would love also escape being shaped by politics of the lack of, uh, of a humanity that is being created within you? Uh, I'm not talking about love in the sense of, uh, uh, of, of again, of something personal, but as, as a power, as a political power. 
as something we can debate, as something we don't belittle, as not something that we can connect to, to especially Christianity about loving or the, the Ten Commandments of like, love your neighbor. No, it is, it's something as a force, as the same force that also motivates us in our lives. You know, we cannot, we feel miserable when we do things we don't love for instance, or we do things, it, it makes us depressed. So why it's not there present as a force uh, so within to, for you to a bigger to, scale? To understand it better. Yeah. Beco yeah, because so I want to move love from the minor scale, from the, the micro. You, for you, the minor scale is like when, when, as many people do, as I often do, is it's the love between people or between animals and people or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> between like small... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, that has and been reduced to the family. So the family love can be there in the family, but not outside. And it's very interesting because it also creates the family. You know, we're thinking about the nation states. The nation states you have. You're very you skeptical know, about the nation states. Yeah. Very and, skeptical. Yeah. yeah. And so it becomes like we love our national members. And anybody going back to migration, we are actually rejecting those because they don't belong. So it's, yeah. Yeah, you said something about this also, which I liked very much. You said um, the state system is based on exclusion and forcing certain definitions and perceptions of the self in relation to the others, which is quite violent. Essentially, it's violent even when it comes in this almost humanitarian patronizing form, like, yeah, I'm welcoming refugees. Yeah. And you said, who are you to welcome anybody? <laughs> But this, I mean, I, I respect and I sympathize to a certain degree with, with these remarks, but also they're quite utopian. They are not, yeah. You know, also, like, also was thinking when I, after I read Abby Warburg and his relation, talking about the snake, snakes instigating migration, and where migration is important as a practice of life. And even in Islam, you know, the years are calculated by the time of the migration. So as you have the, the year, I think, uh, Muhammad migrated or there was some migration happening. So it is the calculation. So you start your history based on migration. And it's very, uh, movement was very important. Suddenly the nation state comes and tells you, no, you're not. You're gonna move as a tourist with somebody who has money and there is a specific type of movement that we can welcome. But this migration, uh, which birds still do, and it's, it's very, you know, there's a whole, Life goes with that, and suddenly the nation state says no. And we will allow you to die, actually, in the sea. And Can you imagine a relationship to the land, that people say, this is my land, or this is my village, without, an, without a structure of a nation state? And if, what would be the alternative for that, for the nation state? This is, uh, I'm actually, I think a lot about that. And, did the nation state destroy our imagination of thinking how we can exist together differently? Though the, the, the nationalism, the nation state, there are very modern structures there, mm -hmm. 200, 300 years. And it's, uh, it's important that we, we think about that, even we imagine that. Maybe literature, this is, uh, it's important to, uh, to consider. And sometimes I think in the context of Palestine, like, you know, do the Palestinians want a nation state to replicate a structure that they have been suffering from? So if, the, the, yeah. yeah, and you this is a no, problem. I don't want this. Yeah, so, and, and I think it's very interesting, and uh, on, also in Palestine, the Palestinian Authority is very problematic, that is to say. Uh, and uh, what kind of structure? i give you an example. We talk about uh, uh, teaching in Palestine. So I... I teach a course uh, called European Modern Thought. We drop European and we drop modern. We remain with thought. This is the course. Okay. And within the course also we're trying to think about this relation of a professor and students, the space we're in, the university, the outside, from whom we are learning, etc. And uh, so we bring 
names of people we would like to learn from that students bring. We go out of the space of uh, the university to discuss text. And there was a text by uh, Foucault about the panopticon. And in Palestine, you have a lot of, lots of watchtowers. Panopticon is that you can be seen from every, every yeah. corner, every angle. You know, you have a watchtower, you have uh, a guard, a soldier there, and watching everybody. So, you know, the panopticon is there. It's filled, and the landscape is filled. So there's one student, he was in prison for seven years, so he's the oldest in the class, and he's very funny. And he says, I want to take Foucault. I say, yeah, sure, take Foucault. And he says, I want to take Foucault, and we're going to go and discuss him in Hebron. In, say, in Hebrew? In Hebron. In and Al Khalil. I say, yeah, sure, because my approach is not to say no to the students. Yeah. And so they arrange buses and everything, and we go to uh, Hebron. And uh, my idea was about the... Um, but that's physically moving from... Yeah. That's already like an act. Yeah, we have like three hours trip. Yeah. They arrange the buses, everything. Check you know, points, there are 170 yeah. students. And uh, so at that moment, I was always thinking of the, the panopticon structure, that how this machine creates... Uh, power relations, one is watching the others, creates fear when we know somebody is watching us, there's a relation of fear. And I was always thinking, if we take the Israeli soldiers out of these uh, towers and you put a Palestinian, uh, you know, resistant leftist Marxist in there, it will continue to produce the same power relations. So I was very optimistic and therefore, I w but what to do with these towers, how do you do? So this student, he takes all of us to Hebron, we go to the buses, and he goes to uh, the martyr street, Shara Shohada. This is the hardest street. You have settlers, military, heavy military presence, and... I've been there, I know. Yeah. 170 students, young and excited. <laughs> we get off the buses, and the students Wait, say... How, how, when was this? That was... Uh, 2016. 2016. Yeah. 16 or 17. So this, we arrive, okay, we arrive. He didn't tell me we want to do it there. He told me he, we want to go to Hebron, to Martyr Street, to the, uh, the Martyr Street. And I didn't know exactly what he want because I leave them. It's, I don't, they can tell me whatever they want, but I don't ask him if they don't want to. So we, everybody gets off the buses and he points to the students like, come, come, follow me. And where he wants us to go around the tower, the watchtower, and there, which there are like four or five Israeli soldiers. And it's like, okay, this is a very dangerous situation. So the soldiers are in the tower. The tower is cement. They know the students will not do anything. They cannot shake. 170 students. You know, my heart is beating. The students approach the tower. They surround it, almost surround it. And this uh, jihad says, okay, students, there's the panoptic on here. I give you an example. And it was fascinating. So the student, there was a moment of tension and, uh, 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 and, but still he says, okay, so we have here the guards. So he turned the whole example, he turned the soldiers into actors and his ex his, they were example for his exercise. He turned them into something for him. And the students were laughing. He said, yeah, they are looking at us. So they can look at us. They, you see how many we are. And, and they were laughing. And the soldiers at the beginning, they were like, you know, alert. And then they saw what these students with papers and laughing, they, they kind of let us. And, and the students were so like, you know, this is amazing. They're laughing, they're continuously laughing and he's laughing and he's mentioning Foucault and this whole French philosophy and uh, uh, post-structuralism in, in uh, Hebrew and downtown using the soldiers and the, the, the tower and the structure that the Israeli military and occupation created to use it to explain this post-structural idea. And what I realize actually, what he does, he's not stuck with my idea that I, either we put a Palestinian or Israeli, he yeah. actually gave the, the, the tower a new function, mm -hmm. a function of a theater. And, and this is an opening. It's not, it's, he's not yeah. destroying that, but he's giving it a new meaning, a new it's role in his opening. life. And yeah. it's another example, I think, of what, what you used before also of transformation. Yeah. yeah. And this is here why I bring it, because sometimes we think there's, there's only this possibility of a nation state 
or if we are the good people, the good-hearted people, we, if we only were the presidents, everything will be perfect. We know it's not. And then we keep trying to think, maybe it is possible this time. Now maybe it's better next time if we do it. And we are not allowed to think of something else. We think it's a problem with the people, but sometimes there's something structural within that. Uh, within that hierarchy, within this form of political engagement, or this the nation state who comes in and who moves and who enters, and uh, I mean, people are dying in the Mediterranean. And, uh, you know, with every death, people are moving there, like disasters. Movements are allowed in a certain way, but not the other way, for the, the one who is powerful, but not the powerless. And, and this is allowed by the nation state. Absolutely. That's... It all depends on your passport. Yeah. It's the nation state, the passport privilege. Um, and we said we don't want to speak about politics. politics. It's always there. <laughs> you even try to uh, politics, even love became suddenly like a large political process. Uh, could, say, could say gave a beautiful blurb, at least a blurb that intrigued me about um, your book, Minor Detail. Um, for those who haven't read the blurb, I will read it to you. Shibli takes a gamble in entrusting our access to the key event in a novel. The rape and murder of a young Bedouin woman to two prof profoundly self-absorbed narrators, an Israeli psychopath and a Palestinian amateur sleuth high on the autism scale. But her method of indiscretion justifies itself fully as the book reaches its heart-stopping conclusion. Um, of course, who doesn't want to have a blurb I could see? But I was intrigued by because he was quite opinionated about the two main characters. Let's start with the first part of the book. About, and the first part reminded not only me, but also some other people of one uh, of the best, or one of the better novels by Kutsi, Waiting for the Barbarians. There's the magist magistrician is waiting um, for, it's is like, falling in love with a prisoner, a, a woman. And here we have a soldier, an officer, who um, is not maybe not in love with a woman, but with a, with a young girl. But he, um, he's both disgusted by her and feels attracted by her. Disgust and attraction, as often, they, they come together. But to me, he's not a psychopath at all. Yes, certainly not to me. No. I'm happy that... that but, uh, yeah. but I am happy that Kutsi says whatever he wants. I mean, I don't that, mind. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> but that would make the whole thing a bit innocent, no? A bit uh, less, less interesting also, because he is it's part of a system. And he is even trying to, within the limits of the system, in my reading, in my interpretation, uh, to be human. Yeah. Yeah, he is, uh, I mean... I, I like my characters, I love them. If, so do I, but even this character. Yeah. <laughs> there. So tell, tell me, how, how did you do that, this? How did you, where did you, f not where did you find him, but where did you find love for this character? You know, it's actually, uh, I, I don't want to uh, exteriorize uh, the ability to commit a crime or to cause pain to others. And I think it's present in all of us somehow. It is part, I mean, for me the question was our personal ability to, to create pain. So he's not an outside, he's an inside. Uh, you asked the author, as the creator, he's inside, he's an insider for you. He's part... Yeah, he's part of our ability as humans to cause pain. Mm -hmm. And this, this ability exists. Uh, maybe we don't acknowledge it, but he's also not acknowledging it. Yeah. It exists for both male, female, doesn't matter. I, don't, I think people are capable of causing pain. This happens, even in, you know, going to love in-person relationships. There is causing pain in this, though you don't want to cause it, but eventually it's caused. And this pain, if, if you take it on that scale, uh, this is the, the micro, but the macro, the political, it, it can be an act that is committing 
uh, by somebody else. I don't think we can uh, other the ability to cause pain. It yeah. exists within all of us. It's not a certain human being who does it. Every, we, each one of us, is capable of, of doing that. I don't know how much we're aware. We acknowledge that. We, we see that. We regret that. We stop at that. This, this remains a question. A lot of times we're in denial because we don't want to know that we are causing pain to others. It's, it's easier to know But that. Isn't, uh, shouldn't we make a difference? Shouldn't we distinguish the pain that you can cause within a relationship by whatever doing, by, 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 by leaving somebody or by... by not loving the other person as this person would like to be loved, and a soldier who is killing a bystander or is raping a girl, committing a war crime. Can we really... Yes, we can this? differentiate. We can. Should, uh, we yeah, should. We um, should. But I'm talking about the ability. It's almost like, uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, creating uh, a huge uh, uh, change... I'm talking about this moment like you almost open the door. You, you hold the door handle to start with this major act. So it's almost the preceding. It's it maybe sometimes I'm a lot thinking about the pre, the moment of pre. All the little acts that normalize it for you to be able to commit a bigger crime. And... Uh, A bigger crime doesn't appear suddenly out of the blue. There's a whole history, uh, like miniatures of, of, of acts, of, of uh, little possibilities that can lead you. The minute is like where you stop yourself, where you take the moment that no, and, and uh, reflecting on that. I'm not that officer, but I know it is the language that I allowed to come in me or created that officer. So in that sense, he's not... A stranger. No, I understand. Is this also the reason, because I was also intrigued by that part, um, that you wrote about a girl that despite that she is, that she resembles, I, I will, I will um, quote directly, and in that moment after dusk, before complete darkness fell, as her mouth released a language different to theirs, the girl became a stranger again, despite how closely She resembled all the soldiers in the camp. So I was asking myself, why did you, and maybe now I understand it better, why did you emphasize that, that she was so close to the soldiers, this girl, this Bedouin girl? In her appearance. In her humanity. No, the, there's, like, there's never anything about her humanity there. It's like their humanity is... It's already taken? is not present, because uh, y th this character, they shape her. They shape her as they wish. They, she dressed up in, uh, in a wax. soldier yeah. clothes, yeah. she's washed, she, her hair is cut, so she's transformed into another that they can accept. It's almost like, you know, the act of assimilation, yeah. you know, when you, when you change somebody to what you can tolerate in your view, you know, yeah. in our landscape, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, remains the language. In this part, that's the book consists of two parts. In the first part, where we see the world through the eyes of the officer, who is not a psychopath. I'm happy that we, uh, that we established that. The dates are quite important. A few times you mentioned the date. The, it starts with August 9, 49, and it ends with August 13, 49. It's the last date. Why were these dates so important for you that, that they come back a few times, that we see that we know what month of the year, what year, and also the place. We are the southern part of the Negev. Why was it important for you to be so exact? Um, in this section, it goes back, okay, to um, uh, how a crime can be reported within the language of the criminal and within the, uh, the, uh, the tools of the, the criminal. Like, because, you know, sometimes you have in investigations, you, when police reconstruct a crime, they ask the criminal to 
create all the steps. To go back. Yeah. yeah. So we always know the crime from the perspective of the criminal. And in that sense, uh, I was uh, trying to build it on the, these uh, sort of reports that sometimes in military, you have uh, this report, so it's a certain language. And I, uh, it is a language that is, I'm not familiar with, and I was actually uh, entertaining myself with my inability to speak this language, like how I can uh, do it. So I was reading a lot of military reports from the whole world, you know. From the whole world, not yeah. only Israeli. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot from the Korean War in, uh, and Korean... Koreans in Vietnam, U.S. Uh, documents. And there is a certain language that it's almost uh, in its perfection uh, kind of clear any emotional uh, uh, or th thinking by this being so precise. As if precision in, in space and in, uh, in dates uh, makes the need for anything beyond this precision unimportant, the, the thinking uh, or the reflection on what is being happening. Uh, so that's, that's the part. It's actually, it, it was so precision, an attempt. It's like the illusion of precision, that thanks to the precision, we, we think we know what happened, but that's not the case. Because There's we, don't, language, see the, we yeah. don't see the crime through the eyes of the victim. No. And this is the whole time also whenever there's a, a trying to, to solve a crime, there's always reliance on the criminal going back to the crime scene or what is being said, a friend says it, uh, I, I borrow it from him, only the criminal can solve the crime. So this is the first part. But what if we, we take that, we leave that language, we say this is not my language, I was pretending to be a good speaker. Let's go back to the language of deletion that this is my intimacy. The and language of deletion, of negation. Yeah, yeah, of absence, of gaps. And then we are back to silence. And we go back to trying to do a new method to try to solve the crime with the victim. What kind of narrative will happen? What kind of possibility will come? Is it only really only the criminal can solve the crime? Do we have access to the victim ever? Can you know when you have a victim, can you ever uh, recall the victim to tell what happened to them? It's never that. We uh, it's not there. We can have their testimony, but the one who solves the crime and what happens, it's only the criminal, and through their language of documentation and precision and trying to make it, yeah, this happened. Uh, and this is also a language of power, uh, the language of police, police reports, of military reports, of all these, it's, it's a, uh, you know, you see something with the language, there is something hovering over the language of these military uh, reports. The U.S. had declassified a lot of documents. And you see the, there's uh, news of, uh, of uh, massacres and how they are being put in one report and with mention of, uh, of numbers, uh, it becomes a short, small report. Mm -hmm. That uh, that language is offering. This is like this going back to the language of the, of the no. state, of the nation yeah. state, of yeah. democracy. Of the powerful, of, of those who have access to archives, of those who eventually, where you write history based yes. on their documents, because the, the other language field of gaps is not suitable for writing uh, history. Uh, so the second part of your book, in which uh, a woman, decades after the crime, goes back, is basically now I understand, an attempt to look at the crime from the perspective of the victim. And maybe that's also, that's also why the, the woman is stuttering and is always transgressing borders and is obviously not very good at language. Or investigation. <laughs> or investigation, yeah. yeah. Is this correct? Would you say that, that yeah, I, was this is what you consciously were trying to do? I mean, it's probably not consciously, but it's something that I discovered as I was working. Because the, the, when I was working the novel, I only was planning to write the first part. And I was working on it, and then... Uh, I, I couldn't think I would write the second part, but as if the, the first part was calling for the second part. 
and within that came a different language. Sometimes, you, you know, we were speaking uh, uh, yesterday about the a process of, of uh, writing. It's not very conscious. You're not so much in control or conscious or no, this. I agree. Yeah. I agree, totally. The phrase men, not a tank, shall prevail comes back a few times, maybe four times or three times. And this is uh, written on a wall. It was a settlement created before 48, and it was the first line of defense against the Egyptians. And this also in this settlement, in the remains of the settlement, is the place where the girl was killed and raped. Yeah. Why was this, and it, it, why was this sentence, this, this writing on the wall, so important for you that you bring it back a few times? Because there's, of course, this irony that, that it was written by the, um, by, the, by the Israelis, by the Haganah, against the tanks of the Egyptians. Yeah. The Haganah that at that time perceived themselves as the power, not the powerful, but the powerless. Yeah. Yeah, and so with this way, sentence, yeah. yeah let, in a way, this by bringing back this sentence all the time, you made me or made the reader realize that the positions have shifted completely and quite rapidly. Com or maybe at that time already. That's the question, how do, you, how do they perceive themselves? For you, for, you, for us, the readers, it's, it's obviously that they are the powerful, but are they so powerful? Also, the, the officer is dying, at least that's how I see the end. He's, he's dying himself. The powerful, the power is crumbling in front of our eyes. I would take the sentence to another place. It's, it's, of course, it plays this role. But also, I mean, this sentence is written in the same spot. It remains in the same spot. The only thing that changes is time. So this sentence travels time, like many other words in the text. And uh, perhaps this... Uh, uh, question that I carry is how certain words, they change their meaning, not because they change the context, because normally we think it's the context that change, but suddenly it's time carries them. You know, you have this time and then you have that time. Uh, I always have this joke, like at the beginning of a relationship, you call somebody say, oh, you're crazy. And then after five years, you say, oh, you're crazy. So how the <laughs> sentence travels. <laughs> You know, the beginning, that's almost like that. That's, that's very nice of you how to, how to, yeah, that's a nice ending also, but I'd like to, to end on, on but maybe there's a connection, but that you're crazy, the different meanings of this sentence, yeah. depending on the time of the relationship you're in. Yeah. Yeah. There was... Because maybe this is, we haven't pointed out this enough, but there's quite a sense of humor in your work as well. And there was one phrase that really made me laugh in all this irony, that's at the beginning of the second part, that the woman um, yeah, you write, and while his action, you're speaking about a soldier, by which I mean pointing his gun at me, cannot be described as humane. It was enough for me to understand what he meant, and that I had to find another way to my new job. <laughs> Yes, the stubbornness, you continue. <laughs> but also the normalization. Yeah. The, the gun is not there to kill you, just giving directions. <laughs> oh, you shift its meaning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. Yeah. yeah. You know, the reader is also shifting the meaning all the time. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, uh, this process of reading is, uh, is really... Uh, is at the center, of, I think, of, of literature. How... We think sometimes this is coming from a, a certain experience or a context, but it's amazing how literature allows a place for others who find themselves by the act of reading. And, and I, I, yeah, this writing, uh, what it carries from a, a certain relation, maybe sensibility, uh, sensitivity, and intimacies that travels and can be shared, like these texts of, that were written. Uh, 1,500 years, and, and we read them now. And, 
And it's very, I would say about these poems, I mean, they're, they're called al muallaqat And uh, they always started on ruins. So the poem should only start on ruins. And this, they are mainly uh, poems. So the act of transformation, turning the, the ruin into a, a moment that brings you somewhere else with, with, a, with the power of language and what language can even lift you from these uh, ruins is fascinating. Yeah. They always start uh, with, with the ruin. And we actually, as kids, we were like kind of joking because you always have this guy standing there looking at the ruins of his lover left and then he goes on everywhere, yeah. <laughs> But the, the final act, or one of the f more final acts of transformation is done by the reader. That's something you're very, yeah. And that's okay. And that's... Even if that's the reader what we says have. he's a psychopath. Well, we know he's not. If he's a good say. If he's good say, okay. <laughs> he's allowed. You have the readers and you have good say. Yes, yeah. that's absolutely. I cannot, yeah, I can, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it's 17 past nine. I can talk uh, with you for many more hours, I believe, um, but this is not very kind to the audience. Yeah. I feel, I sense, or I might feel that they, they have questions as well, so I'd like to uh, give them, the people in the audience, the opportunity to ask questions now. Um, and Jant is uh, walking around with a mic. Please raise your hand and also say your name, that's nice and kind. Maybe an act of love. <laughs> Hello, my name is Janan. I have a question about translation. You talk about silence and language, and I wanted to know, your books have been translated into many languages, and do you believe that the moment we enter the realm of translation, do we break the silence? Uh, it's something is for me with the, with the translation. I mean, yeah, you... As I mentioned, I really love Arabic language, and and the minute that the text is transformed into another language, I I have no more relation to it. Uh, but sometimes I think it what carries, because you mentioned I uh, I, I studied six languages and. Uh, also Korean, no? Yeah. Yes. Why Korean, if I may ask? Uh, because I was uh, living there for a few months and I had to learn it every day. And uh, these languages is, uh, is not like breaking silence as much. They allow you to go back to your language in a different way. We were speaking about this yesterday uh, because in Korean, for instance, uh, if you want to say, uh, I ate an apple, it would be... I apple eating. There's no I ate the apple or like I apple eating. And in Arabic, it would be eat I the apple. So this kind of structure that always you come back to, to language. I mean, I, I, when you play this with, with language, it's, it's almost enriches you uh, or gives you uh, a new entry to, to the language, a, a new sensitivity to language. And uh, sometimes I think also what Arabic can bring in, in a different language, because we have a lot of discussions with the translators uh, that don't make the translation perfect, just keep carrying this accent. And, and you know, there's so much attacks against accents, as if the accents is always a reminder of, uh, of that presence that is somewhere else, and, and we, we find it problematic. Accent against the accent? Yeah. Also in, in written texts, you mean? Yeah, I, I, yeah because uh, accent is not only something that you, Sounds, can, no. you can hear, but also you can uh, bring to, to language. So uh, we have a lot of discussion, don't make the text as, as a... As a perfect English speaker who is graduating from Oxford and, and Cambridge, but it has almost this accent, and the accent is present sometimes in the structure of a sentence, how long a sentence, and we have a lot of these discussions because in Arabic you can combine past, present, and future almost in the same sentence. And you know, we have like 20 emails back and forth between translators. Like, how can we do it? How we can solve it? Like, and really, we would sit four hours, of course, they, 
they are rightly unhappy <laughs> with that when they are badly paid. But it also opens uh, for us like how we can deal with that, how, how these different times can exist yes. together. So more than silence, it's more considering different possibilities of, of, uh, of, of language. Of the, of the self, yeah. Or your relation to language. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the obsession with accents has obviously to do also with the longing to be in the center. Yeah. Yeah. And the fear to be in the periphery, to yeah. be outside the center. Um, and it's amazing accent because they really they carry all the different, the shadow of another language that is being deleted, yeah. that is being negated from a certain context. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Hi, uh, I'm Mela. Um, I was wondering, so you know the situation in Palestine by heart, and I imagine uh, you have passion, like maybe anger. I would say you have, you feel anger uh, towards the situation. And yet the second main character of your novel is, um, for lack of a better word, a bit dry in her prescriptions of, of the situation there. For example, about the bombardments, it's very like um, factual, like this is what's happening, not a lot of uh, feeling there. You were talking about love also earlier. I'm just wondering, like during the writing process, um, is there anger in you and how, like do you sometimes feel that maybe your, your um, descriptions are too strong and you have to adjust them to make them more, because I also know like with the situation of Palestine, people are, um, you have to be a, a bit gentle, <laughs> like you, you, you cannot be too activistic, you should be a, a bit subtle. I'm just wondering, like, what is the process in your writing? Do you struggle a lot with this, like, not too strong, but then not too weak? Uh, okay, you know what yeah. thank you for your question. Yeah, well, uh, the only anger I have is when my son doesn't put his clothes in the basket, the washing basket. <laughs> that really makes me angry, but other than that, I... I I mean, especially in writing, it's not there. It's it's a different. It's I for me writing. It teaches me uh, uh, how to live, in fact, and uh, uh, teaches me how to be the person that I could not be in any different way. So it it is not something that I'm using. Um, it's not something that I'm channeling or doing anything with it. I'm I'm a obedient. Uh, servant for the language, I would say. Uh, and the process is like that. It has a lot of, uh, of, of time allowing, because, you know, language is not mine, and, and we cannot. It is, it's a fascinating la with language that is being shared by so, like, by so many of us. And this is, this is not ours. Uh, it's not mine. And wh when, in fact, I have my name on a text, I think this is very problematic, because I could see the history or the movement of every word, the sound, where it traveled from in the book. They are not my words. And uh, maybe going back to talking about the nation state, maybe yes, we cannot imagine a, a nation state, but the, the togetherness in a text, because of the fact we are all using language, is, is fascinating, I think. To do the togetherness of the reader and to author, or the together. And also the words, how they travel, because uh, you know there's some words, some things. I almost hear the echo, how they reached. They are not mine. Yeah. They, they reached the moment to be written. Uh, so, and that since I say I'm servant, I'm not doing, it's like they travel, sometimes they travel 20 years or uh, five minutes ago, or there's a whole uh, togetherness within that that many people participate. It's, it's, it's not like storytelling. Ellie, no, it is. Could say wrote in Elizabeth Costello that the author is the secretary of the invisible. You might remember <laughs> that, yeah. Um, and also I was in... The psychopath, a secretary. Psycho well, <laughs> we can take care. <laughs> um, so you just said that, that writing is teaching you how to live. Did you say this just? How to... How to yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure that... Yeah. yeah. Okay. And even how not to be a monster sometimes. How, to, how not to be a monster. Yeah. So their anger is just not part of that... Uh, no. No, no. no. I think we're all addicted to anger, but that's another. 
um, issue, not for tonight. Another question. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Jos. Um, I was wondering because I, when I read your book and I, I, you created this girl, uh, her family was already killed. So I thought when I was reading it that probably uh, those military people over there, inclusive uh, the psychopaths, whether he was a psychopath or not, I mean, he is not. He is not. Would, would have any empathy f uh, for this girl. But it seems a little bit later that there was a complete lack of empathy. They just use her as a tool and then throw her away. And I was thinking, because you were always, uh, you were also speaking about migration, the fact that, for example, some people look at other people like um, yeah, they are not the same, or they are like animals, like in Rwanda, they're called cockroaches, uh, the, the, the Tutsis, and then they depersonate the people so that you could see them not as humans anymore. Eh? So how do you think about that? Is that also something that came up in your mind or is it completely different? Because if you don't have the explanation of the writer, I think everybody interprets the book the way he wants to interpret it. Eh? Yeah. yeah, of course, everybody can interpret the book as they, they, uh, they want to. And this is important. That reading is important part of, of, of any book. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it's really the how such acts become normal. And uh, there, there are limits. Now we experience the limits of, of, uh, of our empathy and care when people are drowning, who are trying to survive. You know, they're, they're making these uh, horrific trips uh, and they're trying to save their lives uh, and then within this hope, almost like you're thinking you're going to save your life, y you die. It's, it's like your end comes your end. And then it becomes just uh, an event, a news that we will forget tomorrow or day after tomorrow. And I don't, I'm not blaming ourselves, but I'm wondering how this happens. How, it's not that we are bad, but this happens. Uh, is it because we have our abilities of thinking of caring is it um, because we have other priorities so I'm not judging I'm not saying anything but for me I'm really thinking how this could be possible and this is not something exactly again it's not alien it's not specific to this officer perhaps we're all complicit when there is such a, a death and what we can do, uh, how to, to move away from that, from that lack of empathy and yeah. In a way you, you turn the reader into um, the position of a bystander. Yeah, they're all bystanders. They're all, we are all bystanders. Yeah. And, and you know, when somebody tries not to be, it's, uh, it's not an easy task. It's almost everything tells you don't do it. And this is what we are uh, growing into. Don't do into. what? Don't, don't. don't care too much. Don't get involved. Don't. It's too much. Yeah. You cannot do that. And, uh, yeah. But it's understandable, no? To take that position. Yeah. And, and, and how we live with that. This is also That's a question. question. Yeah. Maybe a last urgent question, or yeah, two, two urgent questions. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ralph. Not sure if the question is urgent, but when I read the book, I was very much uh, touched by the motive of water and the way water is used by the Bedouins before they are killed, and the way the soldiers are using it, and the way it's used in the in the settlement. Would you say there is a link between, uh, let's say, how you relate to the land if you're a nomad or if you have a, a state? nation state structure does that do something your, your perspective to water or natural resources in general hmm. i mean water is is a uh, yeah is it's important a, in the book yeah. as well when she takes the yeah. shower and yeah uh, and actually we were also speaking about this today it's uh, it's almost appears in your conversation every day few times, you know, 
don't open the water too strong. Can you close the water? Like you're being watched, everybody's watching you and how you use water. But you grow up with that, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, being uh, careful with water. And I understand because I come, you know, Family, we are farming, so water is very essential. When there is no rain, what it means as as a, a continuation of life, it's not something that you use. It's something that you live with that gives you life. And I think this relation to uh, also to nature is is very important when you don't subject nature to your control and turn nature into your service. And I think this is also a major question through colonialism when uh, uh, culture pretended to be the master over nature and to use nature for, and, and, uh, for the, the promotion of culture. But what about different possibilities of relations to nature where it's not about using? I know now we are very much thinking of, uh, or not we, I mean, in the Western world, but this is things that we grow up with. They are essential. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's you care uh, about it almost as a, as a family member uh, because it's how it affects others. Yeah, there is disparity. And this is also the disparity of different relations, not only of... Uh, of uh, occupation and, and power relations. Um, and Israeli is using between three times to seven times more than Palestinians' water. Uh, and uh, there's a different relation to water. There's different anxiety. I don't know why we are uh, so anxious about water, but really, I mean, once I saw a film by uh, Ernest Lubitsch from the 1930s, and they were like a man and a woman uh, speaking next to, uh, she was going, it's a silent movie, she was going to fill the bucket with water and then the man appears and the water was open and I was so nervous, just close the water and I, I'm watching this film from the 30s and I cannot watch it because I'm, don't close the water, just continue the discourse and I realized I was, uh, and yeah, you know, they were making fun of me, you're with water. <laughs> <laughs> Which movie was that? What was the title? Uh, yeah, it's it's a short movie uh, by him, and it's really like you know she goes with the water and he follows her, and they're you know and the water's running, and they have this love movements because it's a it's a silent movie. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Arcia. Love hearing you. Uh, love listening to you tonight. Um, as a writer, you have some creative freedom with your own name. Have you ever considered using your birth name? Uh, yeah, but I like my uh, this name. invented name. Yeah, I mean, and now we all share it. Even sometimes when I go to my village, it's like our and the sign because our village is. Also, our village was invented, you know. It's uh, it, the thing with Palestinians, everybody has a different story. So there were villages that were destroyed, 485, but there were villages constructed. And one of the constructions is our village. So it's, there was no village called Shibli. So the village is an invention, and we live there, and we're all called Shibli. It's almost like a... And it's a reconstruction or construction? Uh, it it was, was constructed, yeah. 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 Shibli, yeah, this, uh, and this is also why. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Shibli is the, the cub, the, the son of the lion. The, the yeah. son of the lion. Yeah, so yeah. all the sons of the lion. And yeah. You're all sons of lions. Yeah, almost like, uh, what's it uh, in the Jungle Book? The uh, the <laughs> that's, that's why you like the name so much. <laughs> yeah, that's why you're attached to it. That's there is uh, uh, some poet from the... 10th century, 9th century, but he has no relation, but still I feel like, okay. Since he's, he's also called Shibli. He's called Shibli, yeah, Abu Bakr Shibli, yeah. So at least there's like this guy from 1100. You have the same ago. name, so you can... Yeah, we yeah. can... <laughs> and your son, has your son the name Shibli in his passport, or the name yeah. is fine? Yes, yeah. he's Shibli. Yeah. Another Shibli. Yeah, we're very proud of our uh, invented name. It's of a, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's like somebody invented something and you're so happy about so it. So you, can, you <laughs> can feel responsible for it. You yeah. It's not forced <laughs> upon me. This is my own choice. Yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. the evening has come to an end for now. Adani, I'd like to thank you for being here well, and for you. um, your insightful answers and 
for a lovely conversation about silence and language and oppression and no anger and getting a better person by writing. <laughs> and could see was there also. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for being so, uh, for listening so with so much concentration and for being so um, polite not to uh, indulge in with your questions into all kinds of political stuff which uh, <laughs> Adiada didn't want to answer. Um, we will be back, I will be back with another guest. I'm not sure yet who is this person but it will be later this year. And also I'd like to mention that you can buy, at least I'm looking at the publisher. Where's the publisher? Yeah, the good evening publisher. Um, you can buy uh, Shibli's book tonight, no? Can you buy? No, you, can, you cannot buy. Well, you can run to the bookstore tomorrow morning if you haven't done it already. Uh, nine o'clock at the name opens if you live in Amsterdam. You go there, I tell you this, and you buy Shibli's book. And... and and she can, yeah. We already signed. She, she's signing it in that name. At what time? No, they are already signed. Oh, they already signed. Wow. So, buy how many? How many copies? Enough. Enough. <laughs> if, if they're not sold out, I have your names, I have your numbers. If they're not sold out, I will come after you. Okay. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, here, I would like to thank the publisher. Sorry, because we were talking uh, to thank, you know, the publisher for bringing the book into Dutch. Into yeah, thank you. Thank you, publisher. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a beautiful... It's the first text in Dutch, actually, I it's ever have. It's the first novel, your first text in Dutch. Yeah. It's beautiful done by Copernic. Yeah. So, uh, have a good evening. Uh, get uh, home safely and see you soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.